I'm Markus Fallner, hello and welcome here. I'm going to talk about why open source is a question of national security. I'm going to introduce myself and at the end I'll do a little bit of advertisement for the company that sent me here. Probably many of you know me, but not many know the company that I'm currently working with. I have 15 minutes as far as I see, so I'm, I'm doing a quick run through. Yes, somebody, some of you may know me. I'm a priest diplomat, Ambassador Jedi Knight from Regensburg, which is close to Nuremberg here, one hour. Um, you can ask me in private why I, what that means that I'm a priest and diplomat ambassador and all this other stuff. I once did a keynote here at one of the OpenSUSE conferences that explained all of that, and some people were really op um, surprised. <laughs> um, in a different kind of reality, I am a senior journalist. I was deputy editor-in-chief of the Linux magazine and Heise IX. I work as a consultant for my own company, and I consider myself something like an open source veteran, even though I'm not a coder, but I've been doing Linux since 1994. And I work as an open source ambassador for um, Grumunio. 30 Minuten, yeah, wunderbar. Yeah. I work as an open source ambassador for Gromunio. I did the same job before for OwnCloud. And I do a lot of things that people would consider open source PR. And I, before that, I was team lead at the SUSE documentation team, like some others that we just saw. <laughs> and um, yeah, I already said that I was at Linux Magazine and Heise. And I consider myself like I'm, I'm old and I'm in. I'd like to see myself as something like an open source business angel. I help companies to do open source, to find their way to to learn about what they have to change in terms of inner source and how the company setup should be. And I help open source companies to get more outreach. And this is exactly what I'm doing here and why you see the Gromunio logo, logo on my slides also. Um, my recent works and research so I, is... I, apart from that, I, so I've got the three heads, I've got my own company, I'm with Gromunio, and I'm a journalist, and as a journalist recently I'm doing research in ethical AI, in open washing, oops, that was, yeah, here we are back, I should go to presentation mode, I guess, <laughs> no, um, ethical AI, open washing, and just recently started some research in how much open source is being used in space, and you'd be surprised to hear what they are doing and what wouldn't be possible. The web telescope wouldn't be possible without open source, for example. Same applies to the Ingenuity Mars rover. Awesome. Um, I've been with SUSE quite a long time. I don't know if any one of you was uh, with SUSE when Attachmate came in. But I've visited one of their offices long after they were gone, and I found this keyboard in one of the American um, offices. If you see the problem, then you are probably a little bit aware of um, security issues. And that is actually what we are talking about today. Um, uh, open source as a question of national security. This talk will show you some holiday pictures and some cat pictures and some nice links and hopefully some, some, some uh, include some jokes to laugh about. Well, I'm showing you a lighthouse. I know a lighthouse that, that is in, uh, actually on Jersey or Guernsey on one of the Channel Islands where I was a few weeks or months ago. And um, Lighthouse is a meme that has been very, it has been used very much, I know that. But there's one thing about the British Lighthouses that I did not know. They are still running, and many people think they're just running for the tourists, because in times of GPS, you don't need lighthouses anymore. But the British told me that they are also still using the lighthouses and keeping them in good shape, because they don't control and they don't own the GPS. So there's two GPS systems, one is controlled by the Americans, yeah? and there's one that's controlled by the Europeans. By the, and the, the situation with the UK and the, and the Europeans is uh, delicate, let's call it that way. So the lighthouses will still work even if there's no satellites anymore, even if the countries that run them are totally down. So they consider these lighthouses not only a tourist attraction, but also a question of national security because the boats will be able to go. And we have that just recently because um, what, what can happen? So here you have a map of Middle Eastern Europe. This is the Baltic Sea here, going up here. Here is Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Estonia is not on the picture, but Kaliningrad and the, the red and blue spots, or hexagons here, 
show areas where the GPS signal is jammed. We don't know who would do something like that. No, we have no idea. Nobody knows why. It's also interesting that it's also jammed over Poland. And if you have the larger map, you see it's also jammed over Crimea. No idea why and who does that. Anyhow, it is being jammed. And that is, uh, a, yeah, that is also a question of national security when you think about it. Because we had some planes going to Lithuania that couldn't go there and couldn't land because they didn't have a position. So. Um, another thing from another um, another story about national security is I was in Scotland and this is Helensboro, nice little town. If you ever are there on a on a sunny day, go there, sit in a sunbed on the beach or on the in a cafe. It's the safest place you could be on this planet in case of a nuclear war. They they will tell you it's not a tourist destination. There's a nice bar, there's a nice swimming pool, a good good ice cream, but that's it. But it's the safest place in case of a nuclear war. Why is that? Well, because of this. This is um, a naval base in the, in the UK. Um, it's in Scotland, of course. And this is where the UK is maintaining its uh, nuclear uh, missile, uh, mi uh, its, nu its nuclear submarines with the Trident missiles on it, with the Trident program. I don't know if you're aware of that, but the UK has still nuclear deterrent as a program. It costs billions. There's a nice TV series on its failures. It's called Vigil. It, if you can watch it, watch it. It's great. This is the base, the naval base, where they repair and maintain their submarines. So in, in lots of military games and trainings, they did um, yeah, military games to find out with a red team and a blue team, attackers and defenders, who would attack which goal, which destinations, which targets with nuclear bombs and whatever. And over 20 years, the only, mili the only very, very important military spot where never, that never was bombed with a nuke, that was never nuked by the attackers, was this naval base. And so they started asking, hey, uh, General, why did you not consider throwing a nuke on this base? It's very important. And, and the general said, well, if we have a nuclear war, this is the only place where none of your submarines will be. That's pretty obvious. They will not be there. They will be somewhere out there in the world you know, trying to shoot their rockets. So and that is why the people in uh, Helensboro say they are the safest place in case of a nuclear war. And this, the, the background behind this story is, it's um, again, why is Britain at having this at all? And this, this impacts uh, the Brexit. Scottish people would rather be with the, U with the European Union as a at, at a large degree. But um, Britain has invested a lot in its uh, military capabilities. And so they have this place here. They have the Trident program, which is worth billions. And why? Because they do not want to be depending on some strong, however friendly, guardian they want to have their own nuclear deterrent, so they want to be independent. Independent. That means we have dependencies. We know this now after COVID, uh, Corona, and after Putin and his war on Ukraine and the gas and fuel topic, we know that this is uh, something that we should or even can fix. But apart from fuel and energy and resources, we also have the problem that our hardware mostly comes from another interesting country in, on the other side of the globe, and all of our software is coming from another country on the other side of the globe. And uh, so we, we can buy sofas and more sofas and more sofas until we realize that this sofa actually um, is made of wood, is not comfortable at all, and this was one large tropical tree, mahogany tree, whatever, I don't know. And um, the problem is with this stuff that we buy, it's not always nice people that we buy it from. And what can we do? We can choose which uh, oligarch we want to buy our stuff from. So from, from left to right, you know, this is the Chinese president here. Yeah? This is Peter Thiel. Very, I, I, he's, not ugly as a per, he's not ugly as a person, but his Vita is very ugly and he supports alt-right, right-wing with lots of money. He's a billionaire and close friend of Zuckerberg and whatever. Yeah, you know Putin. Yeah, he was in this. This was in the Daily Show this week, and John Oliver said that uh, 
where many people think about Bill Gates as how many times did he fly on a plane with Weinstein? <laughs> but I don't know what about that. The king of Saudi Arabia and uh, the, the last and the probably future president of the United States. So that's the people we depend upon. Do you feel good now? I don't. Germany especially is in a bad situation because we, we are paying billions of dollars, of euros, um, to Microsoft and Oracle. So there's a lot... There's six billion until 2030, and just in software licenses. I call this software imports because we only get usage rights, but we don't improve a situation, we don't change anything. And uh, just this week, Anke Dumschelt back from the German Parliament um, found out and, and, and told us in a press release that it's also 600 million for VMware. All of them very nice com uh, companies, I guess. So how can we get rid of this? I coined the term blameware a long time ago. Blameware is software that you buy when you don't, have, when you don't want to take um, responsibility. Yeah? So you outsource the blame. And what you get in return is a vendor login. So you're depending on somebody else. Yeah? And as Pilar Santa Maria, the SUSE's new vice president AI, said last week on the SUSECon, you have to act now with AI tools because if you don't act, so if you do, you'll be the driver. If you don't, you'll be the data. And uh, we can discuss this later, but <clears throat> well, that, that inspired me to have a cat picture in my talk. So this is also in, in, in Scotland. The cat was very friendly and so were the chicken, but the cat loved the car yeah? and it got in the driver's seat. And that's, that's, I think that's, that's a nice picture for what you get. Yeah? You get somebody else in your driver's seat with a, an interesting character, maybe. And what, he, what is he doing? Yeah, he's just looking out to get your assets. Yeah? She's, she's probably hungry and looking at the chicken. And what do we want to get rid of? Or what, do we should, get, what should we get rid of, in my opinion? Yeah, there's, uh, we had the term MAGA when Facebook was still there. Today, it's MAGA MX or whatever. It's Microsoft, Apple, Google, Amazon, X, and Meta. These are all dependencies that we have. And there's also some other that are not as big. That's, for example, a lot of people are concerned about their Confluence Gyra addiction, especially since they rose, raised the prices. And uh, also because we had the, the press release just now, VMware or similar vendors. Atlassian is the vendor of Confluence and Gyra. The solution is pretty obvious. It's open source and or the Fediverse for like X or Meta. And... Uh, we have one special, one special big dependency, and that is where Gromunio comes in. That is the dependency on Microsoft and it, its exchange uh, servers and protocols. And um, those old buildings that we're all using, they sometimes come in a very, very bad shape. And Microsoft Exchange is a good example for that. And I'm sure this is not new to you. So last year, it became well known that Microsoft had lost or was stolen a master key for its um, authentication mechanism for its cloud products. So the, the, if when you, it's, it's, it's very worse, very bad once you start thinking about it because the question that you end up with is, why is there a master key? <laughs> yeah? Do we need a master key? Wait, wait, how could it be stolen? If there is a master key, how did you protect it? And yada, yada, yada. It's a, it's a long trail of, of really co very, very worrying questions. And so it, 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 that also was so bad that even the US government could not make this unseen. So they, they, they said a corporate culture, it, it, what, what made this, this, this whole disaster, which makes every one of your Microsoft clouds vulnerable to attackers, um, what made this disaster possible is actually a culture, uh, the wrong culture at Microsoft. They said a corporate culture that deprioritized both enterprise security investments and rigorous risk management. Do you know what that means? Quick and dirty, money is important, not really the security of our customers. That's what the US government says was the mistake at Microsoft. Then um, this culture also leads to other problems Links that you should read, maybe uh, in Scotland, the, um, the, uh, the, the schools and the administration had to admit that Microsoft admits no guarantee of sovereignty for UK, UK policing data. So the data that they get, they say, 
we don't guarantee we can't guarantee anything for that. Um, German schools run into the same problem. They cannot assure data protection rules with Microsoft 365. It's just too big a topic for them. And um, just this week in the news, the Delos Cloud is a cloud that should replace the Microsoft Cloud by a Microsoft Cloud run by SAP. Spot the mistake, but um, and it's but then it's uh, digitally sovereign. Because SAP has promised to run it in, uh, Germ in German or European data centers and it will take over all the things that Microsoft did. Yeah? So that's why it's digitally sovereign then. And the weird thing is the lobbyism that's going on. It's, it was this week, the rumors were pretty confirmed that Chancellor Scholz himself wanted the federal states of Germany to accept the Delos cloud over all the open source uh, projects that they're actually running at the moment. Thankfully, it looks like that the decision was not cast and it was postponed, but we have to be very attentive to that. And how the difference in culture is that the open source culture is also very open and clear about dangers and problems that we have. Yeah? So this is also a picture from a former holiday for me. In the first moment, when you go to this place, that is actually the Little Sahara National Park in the US, where there's gigantic sand dunes. And yeah, obviously, people seem to be digging tunnels in these sand dunes, and there's a uh, accidents happening. I think it's more the, 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 quad, the quads that are going around there, these all-terrain vehicles, and people acting stupid. But first, when I first saw this picture, I, I thought, oh God, this is a dangerously, ter uh, dan uh, terribly dangerous place because they had an accident four days ago. But actually, this is transparency about their security failures or uh, uh, transparency about bad things that had happened. And that's why I've got it in this talk, because I think this is the culture that we need. We need to be open and talk about the shit that we're using, that we're causing, that has happened. And... Um, Another picture from Ireland that also goes in the same direction, then I'm done with the holiday pictures as far as I remember. Um, what you see here is some mountains in the northwestern part of Ireland. Yeah, I'm good in time. And it's somebody, and they, they did uh, petroglyphs, we called it. Yeah? Somebody wrote air, the, air, the Gaelic word for Ireland, on rocks and on hills. And you find this everywhere on the Irish coast. And what you also see is here's a number, 71. Yeah? And I was asking, why? Yeah? And they told me, yeah, this is from the Second World War. We were neutral then. So Ireland was neutral in the Second World War. But at some point, the German Air Force bombarded Belfast. Northern Ireland was not neutral. It was part of the UK. So the Irish were like, holy shit, the Germans can go as far as Belfast with dropping their bombs? They might be dropping our country. Yeah? And we've got so much fog on our coast, so they might be mistakenly bombard us. And then they were like, yeah, and also the Americans, the, uh, the, the American planes, they come from across the ocean and maybe they think they are in France now. So uh, in an effort to prevent accidental bombing on Irish, and which was neutral territory, by mistakenly thinking, by the pilots that just come out of the fog and mistakenly thinking this is, this is France, yeah, or no, not Germany, this is, yeah, this is France, the Irish put this on their ground, telling, the, the, uh, the, telling the, the, the pilots, you're in Ireland. Yeah? And um, they made it very op openly visible on, on hills that are very exposed. And the number here is that there is a directory. <laughs> so the pilots could look up in a directory where the fuck in Ireland they are. <laughs> so that is an, uh, kind of an open information system that created some kind of security for the Irish people, or at least they felt better. So if we want to have um, digital sovereignty, openness, and security, we have to think about it on a lot of different levels. Yeah? The last one that we had, the Irish model was basically on the OZ layer 10. You may be surprised about the additional OSI la layers that we have here, because most of you probably know the first seven, which is from hardware to application. Then some of, some of you may know the joke about the problem sitting in front of the computer. That's the layer 8. Yeah? That's a very old joke. And some years ago, I found the other layers, 8, 9, and 10, and I added one more that is layer 11, that is problems like climate change. Yeah? And uh, the, that is, I think we can, we can put our problems with digital sovereignty and security, national security. We can always think about which layer to address them. Is this management? Is this organizational? Is this governmental? And if you are at Siemens, 
then you may be with Siemens or other companies, you may be at layer 10 rather, and the government is below you, or that's at least what people at Siemens think, managers. And um, so the thing about open source is we are depending on software from other countries, and we are the ones, not the thing about open source, the thing about the, the enterprise software that we use, we are largely depending on other countries and open source is the way out. And we can do a lot of things and that's where the ad starts because I'm with Gromunio since March and I think that that is the best chance of getting rid of exchange dependencies. And that's, uh, yeah, that's, I'm sorry, there, 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 there are some more holiday photos. These are holiday photos from me. Um, that's where the ad starts for Gromunio. I don't know if anybody of you wants a can of all-day breakfast now. I would not. So, um, we had this pro these problems with exchange that I mentioned, with, about the keys stolen and about ransomware and other things. And one of our... So, Gromunio is doing an open source replacement for Microsoft Exchange. And one of our showcase customers is the Helmholtz Center in Berlin. They had a ransomware attack, a severe one, last year, but luckily they already had been testing Gromunio for a few months and uh, they, so that they could replace it, replace the exchange within two weeks and after the, the massive ransomware attack they were up and running again after two weeks because they were working with one of our partners, that's the Open Telecom Cloud, so Gromunio is the open source software solution that is uh, the number one that is the open source software groupware solution in the Open Telecom Cloud. It's the product that's called Open Source Collaboration there. What we're doing is, um, it's on a, it's, we, 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 the, the good thing is we start on a very low level. We, re, we are not providing an Outlook plugin or, re, or registry entries or whatsoever. No, we are really uh, replacing the exchange protocols. Yes, that's fine. Um, replacing the exchange protocol, no, we are replacing um, the um, implementation of the exchange protocols on the server. So um, a Gromunio server will behave towards an Outlook client just like an exchange server does. It's exactly the same protocol, it's exactly what the, exchange, what the, uh, the Outlook client expects. Or, and that is why there is neither a plugin for Outlook, no registry entry, no Android client, and no iOS client necessary for Gromunio. Because it's all already there. There are exchange clients already there. And on top of that, we uh, combine open source and Microsoft standards. And yes, there is uh, clients for Linux and for the web, of course, because of that. Um, we also have, we have groupware, we have my, um, mobile device management, we have Archive, we have uh, Grumonio Meet, which is Jitsi integrated, and we have Grumonio Chat, which is MetaMost integrated. And then there is Files and Office, which is actually a Next Cloud. And behind it, there is Gromox, is the core of Gromunio, is a, an, an, that's a fork of a fork of a fork of Zarafa Kupano, and it's implemented in C by somebody else a long time ago, and has been reworked over the last years, and so there's almost no original code left. But it's uh, up to eight times faster than the original, and it's all open source, it's all open source standard tools used to build it. As I said, there's Chitsi, Metamos, Nextcloud, and there is Gromunio tools for admins from CLI to API to web and so much more. This is um, what it looks like, the web interface. Here you have mail and I'm actually just a mouse over why this is activated, but there's calendar, contacts, task, notes, files, chat, and this is the chat, this is the MetaMost integrated in the IC. I know you see that this is not really magic here, but it's good integration. And then there's archive, meet, and another files uh, window because you can have more than one server integrated. You have an, an admin. This is the admin interface with a lot of uh, really cool features. You can do, it's the first open, it's the first open source groupware that is multi-domain multi capable, so multi-tenant capable. So we, if you're a hoster, you can have one um, Gromunia instance controlling your 20, 50, 100 different domains for uh, exchange domains, Windows domains, whatever. And um, there is a, um, a Gromunio desktop application which is written in, uh, which is an, an Electron framework based thing. So this is for cases where you, where you want a predefined browser environment. Yeah? Then you have this, this app. I'm using it as you can see on my own terminal server. Because this app is just running there, I don't have to do anything. It is. Uh, always there in no matter what browser, what things happen with the browser. 
And this is the last slide. And we have uh, already, the next project is already in the making, maybe about Gromonio. I said, we have a third, something like 30 people. The company is about four years old. I'm with the company since March. And uh, we have something like 20 developers. And out of these 20 developers, 10 of them are, uh, okay, there's, our, yeah. We have 20 developers. And in the whole world, there's about 20 developers that have understood Microsoft Exchange protocols on a level as 10 of our developers. So there's 20, wrong, 20 developers in the world that have a profound knowledge of the exchange protocols and how they work. 10 of them are with Gromonio, the other 10 are at Microsoft. That's what Jan sitting there said on his uh, FOSDEM talk also. If you want to know more about that, there'll be a, a Gromonio talk in a few minutes here. And this is the next client, Gromonio Next. And this is actually the first um, ever um, group where a client that makes complete use of Microsoft Graph. Microsoft Graph is the meta API, Jan, correct me if I say it wrong, is the meta API that holds together and that works in uh, Microsoft 365 in the cloud. Yeah, so every application there, they're communicating over uh, Microsoft Graph. As I was told, it is very, very complex and goes into very much, much details. You can address a single field in an Excel file with this API. And so what our colleagues and Jan did is they, they did our next web client completely based on Microsoft Graph. And that is totally new, coming soon for you. Thank you for this one minute sign. Questions? Yeah? Hi, Markus. Um, thanks for the talk. As you know, I work for a um, for Amazon, which is a large one of these large companies. But every time every time somebody says hey, this should be a national capacity, I want to stand up in Dresden and say, "Hey, this is us. We're literally a German company too." Um, how, how can I like? And I consider myself working for for a large company. How can these large companies work together with and to fulfill the needs of? Uh, of governments and, and eventually, eventually well, the, the community to offer the products, make some money as, as it's always a business, and do the good things um, without kind of being too antagonistic as in saying, hey, you have to offer everything for free, which doesn't really work in, in the business world. Do you have any ideas how we can uh, uh, go into this direction of, of having a corporation where everybody's happy? Yeah, the biggest problem is that the, the, the laws between the U.S. and Europe are so diametrically different. So the U.S. wants to have uh, a deep look, or wants to have the cap capability of having a deep look into every single customer's data of every single American company, no matter where on this planet this customer is sitting. That's the U.S. Cloud and U.S. Patriot Act that require that. In Europe, we have the opposite uh, regulation, which says that uh, that's an opt that, that should not be allowed and should be documented and only if the courts and whatsoever. So it's, um, when it comes to secret services, it's, it's similar but still different. That is the, the core problem that American companies or companies that are based or headquartered in the U.S. can't guarantee the same rights as European countries can. Um, the, the problem um, is that, or not the problem, there is, however, a movement in the U.S. coming from California that uh, big software companies in California or big cloud companies in California say this is a business uh, disadvantage for us compared to the Europeans because everybody in the world who does not want to have an easy backdoor, easy way in for American secret services or American prosecution or whoever, it's also about economy, uh, Wirtschaftsförderung, well, how do you say, call this in English, um, about boosting the American economy over other countries. So everybody who has an interest in not sharing his business secrets with American authorities or American companies will go for European products. That's what the software companies from California complain about. And so that's why California is actually creating a, a GDPR style regulation and they are trying to make it accepted uh, all across the U.S. So they, there is a prob the pro they know the problem. The question is just how 
how far will they get with it? Will it be successful? And how reliable is it with the changes that are about to come in the US regarding the next election and, and, and. And that is, the, the, pro the problem for us is um, we, on, we can only rely on the things that are under our control, like the lighthouse, the British, the, the nu nuclear program and whatsoever. The companies themselves, I think it is very, very hard for them to fulfill two different sets of compliance. <laughs> It's actually impossible. I, I, I talked to IBM long, long ago, long time ago, 10, 20 years ago, at a, when there was CBIT, the old ones may remember this big fair. I asked them, okay, IBM, you have your most, many people in Stuttgart, Bibling and whatsoever, but, but how do you react if a US a prosecutor, if an attorney of law comes and says, I want access to this data center because there is someone in there that did some felony in the US. How do you react? How, how will you say no? Yeah, and they, they just can't. So it's, it's, a, it's kind of a split brain situation for, for companies. And at the moment we're in a situation that they are trying to find a way out like the Delos cloud. That's also why I mentioned that. It's very, very obvious that a, that a Microsoft 365 cloud will still be a Microsoft 365 cloud even if SAP calls it Delos. <laughs> and it will still have the same issues and backdoors and, and security problems and will still be provided by the same company with the same culture. I think that, that, that Amazon has a completely different culture when it comes to IT, and that is also because I, I, I know peop, people like you. And the, the problem is um, how, how can companies that really want to comply, even Google, I, I, I trust in, that Google wants to, to comply with the European rules, but they, they can't, or am I wrong? Time will tell, I guess. So my only solution is to get rid of as much software from countries that don't follow our European rules. They could, but then they couldn't make business in the US. <laughs> Hi, Marcus. Uh, I have to point out the obvious. Uh, the only component that is a fork of Cupano is the current web client. Everything else is not. Yeah, that's what I, what I meant with everything has re been reworked completely and yada yada. Thank you very much. There was another question somewhere, or am I wrong? I'll have another talk in a few minutes also here about more about Grumonio, so then you can also ask. Thanks. <laughs>